Welcome to the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. My name is Eric Bjornstad. I'm your guide through the ever-changing world of fuel. The Fuel Pulse Show podcast is intended for people who use fuel or who have things that use fuel. So that's whether on the job or at home. And uh, it also is intended for people who might have jobs that require them to manage or take care of uh, some kind of stored fuel that they need to use in order to get the job done. So the Fuel Pulse Show podcast is for all sorts of people. And if any of that sounded like a little bit like maybe what you do, then this show is definitely for you. So what are we going to talk about on this episode of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast? Well, last time we did a part one of a two-part series on the most important tests that you need to know about to manage and take care of stored fuel. And so last time uh, we said we were going to do a top 10 most important tests and we did number 10 and we got through number nine before we said that we would finish the rest of those today. Uh, and before we kicked off that list, we spent uh, some time giving some background, some context to this whole thing. We introduced this essential idea that uh, the best way to take care of stored fuel or the old way to take care of stored fuel doesn't really apply anymore because fuels have changed so much. Uh, we use the example of uh, preventing microbial problems in fuel, which are a big, big problem today, but way back in the day, they, they would say, or they would operate under the assumption that all you had to do was keep water out of the tank, and then you wouldn't expect to ever have to deal with any micro problems, and that's most definitely not the case today. And so what we did is we introduced this idea that there's no one thing that encompasses everything that you have to do to take care of stored fuel. We introduced what we call the hybrid approach. We said that, you know, if you talk to a, a fuel additive company, they'll say, well, all you need to do is add this chemical or put in this fuel additive and all your problems will be solved. And that's not really true. Uh, and we said, or if you talk to a fuel polisher, a fuel polisher will say, well, all you need to do is polish the fuel. Well, that's not true either. We said that you actually need to do three things. You need to, you know, if you think of it kind of like a triangle, you, you need to introduce chemicals or consider chemicals. You need to consider mechanical uh, fuel processing, if you will. And then the third one, which we said was, kind of the one that was overlooked by everybody is testing. Chemicals, mechanical, testing. Those three things together uh, will give you the, the best multifaceted approach to taking care of stored fuel, keeping it healthy, making sure that it is in good condition for when you need to use it. And so we talked a little bit about what testing was, and we talked about some, some concepts centered around this, this need to uh, know what testing can and cannot tell you, the need to know what you're looking for so that you can pick the right kind of test, the need to know if the test that you're considering, uh, what that is actually going to tell you and if it's going to be relevant to your problem. So we spent probably a good 30, 35 minutes talking about that before we went into test number 10, uh, which was density or specific gravity, and then test number nine, which is cold filter plug point. Um, and so today we're going to do numbers eight through number one, count down the rest of the list of the top 10 most important tests that you need to be familiar with in order to make sure that you're taking care of your stored fuel as best you can. And so we kick it off with number eight, the eighth most important test for managing stored fuel health and preserving for stored fuel health is the ASTM test for sulfur, D2622. So sulfur content is definitely among the most important fuel tests because there are pretty strict regulations that limit the amount of sulfur, the sulfur levels that are allowed in diesel fuel. So for a long time, way back in the day, 
you used to be able to have as much as 5,000 parts per million. Um, that was, uh, you know, back in the 80s and before. And then in, I believe it was 1992, they cut that down by 90%. They cut it down to 500 parts per million. Um, and then 15 years or so later, 2007, they issued this ruling that they were going to cut it down even further and they were going to cap maximum sulfur level at 15, 1, 5. So you've gone from 5,000 to 15 parts per million in the span of, I don't know, 25 years or so. And so the fuel that we have today is called ultra low sulfur diesel. And it, when they first started out in 2007, when they were first phasing this rule in, it only applied to on road diesel. So the diesel fuels that went into standalone generators and used in agriculture and used in marine uses, those are not on road uh, applications, if you will. And so those were exempt for a number of years, but then eventually the rule came for them as well. And so it doesn't matter if you're getting, if you drive a big rig or if you have getting, if you're getting diesel fuel for a generator, it's all going to be ultra low sulfur diesel. It's all going to be maximum 15 parts per million. Now the sulfur test is really important because uh, it's a regulatory issue that can have fairly substantial legal penalties associated with violating it. And it is especially, you know, the sulfur test is especially important for hospitals and healthcare facilities to pay attention to uh, because of this thing called Joint Commission. Joint Commission is the group formerly known as JACO, J-A-A-C-O, and they will tell you, they'll quick to tell you, they do not go by JCO anymore. They are the Joint Commission. Um, and they are the ones that inspect the hospitals. And the Joint Commission inspectors have made it known that they really pay attention to the sulfur levels of the fuel that these hospitals are, the backup fuel that these hospitals are required to, to have and to maintain. And anytime a, a Joint Commission uh inspection is scheduled to come around, it makes hospital administrators pretty nervous um, because it's really, really important. And one of the things that makes hospital administrators and healthcare professionals who have to deal with this, one of the things that makes them really nervous is that the inspectors have the ability or the potential to look at just about anything. However, they typically won't say exactly what they're looking for, and different inspectors can choose to focus on different things. You don't know exactly what they're going to be looking at, which means you have to prepare for everything, right? So a, a, a sulfur test for the fuel can be pretty important. Um, and so what happens if you uh, uh, get your sulfur test results back and it's too high? Um, you want to you, you, you want to make sure that when you do your sulfur test that you leave enough time to take action to fix the problem of your sulfur levels being too high and excess sulfur levels is one of those problems where there's not really an easy fix to that problem there is not something on the the chemical side that you can add to the stored fuel that will lower the sulfur content or make it go away. It doesn't really work that way. There's no magic solution to fixing that problem. Um, and so really, if you have excess sulfur levels, if your sulfur levels make this diesel fuel out of spec, then the only thing that you can really do is uh, figure out a way to get additional fuel to essentially dilute that fuel down, um, so which means you may have to end up taking some out. Um, you may have to end up getting rid of some of that fuel um, because that's really the only way that you're going to be able to lower those sulfur levels. And um, if you think about it, lowering sulfur levels is kind of a math problem. You know, if you've got a, I don't know, a 500 gallon tank, it's supposed to be 15 parts per million, but let's say that it comes back and it's 35. Well, you can do the algebra on that, and you can figure out how much um, um, how much you need to take out of that 
500 gallon tank and then how much ultra low sulfur diesel you need to add in keeping in mind that ultra low sulfur diesel does not come to you at 15 parts per million thank goodness it actually typically will come to you between four and six and so you take that into account you figure out how much you need to dilute the fuel by and then that's basically how you lower your sulfur levels down so the test that tells you what you need to know about this is ASTM D2622, the sulfur level test. And because of the, the regulatory requirements and the potential penalties and problems that violating this rule have for hospitals, healthcare facilities, and other places, that's why we name the sulfur test, sulfur content, the number eight most important fuel test that you need to know about. Okay, let's move on to number seven. Number seven is ASTM D93 Flashpoint. So Flashpoint is, is it's a property of the fuel. It's property of just about anything, what the Flashpoint temperature is. And the Flashpoint test, D93, remember we talked the last time, if you saw the la the previous episode, we talked about descriptive tests versus predictive tests. We said descriptive tests are the kind that tell you something that's true about the fuel right at this moment. And Flashpoint is one of those descriptive tests. Flashpoint is simply the temperature at which something can be ignited when exposed to an ignition source, like a, like a flame, for example. And it is among the most important fuel tests for a couple of important reasons. Uh, reason number one is Flashpoint is in D975. Remember, we said that ASTM had this, this group of specifications called D975, and they tell you the legal definitions of diesel fuel. And Flashpoint is one of those legal definitions, which means... If you have something where the flash point is too high or too low, then uh, technically it's not diesel fuel, or at the very least, it's diesel fuel that is out of specification. So reason number one why the flash point test is, most, is, is, is among the 10 most important is it's part of the legal definition of what diesel fuel is. And knowing if the flash point of your diesel fuel is out of spec can also give you a clue, this is number two, it can also give you a clue as to whether contamination of diesel fuel has occurred. Remember last time we talked about density and we said one of the things that you can use density for is if the density is too high or too low uh, as compared to normal number two diesel fuel, that's a pretty strong clue that it has been contaminated with something like gasoline or some other kind of lighter or heavier hydrocarbon. And Flashpoint kind of works the same way. ASTM D975 says number two diesel fuel has to have a minimum Flashpoint temperature of 52 degrees centigrade. 52 degrees centigrade, if I remember the math off the top of my head, is about, we'll call it 130 degrees. I may be off a little bit, but it's something around there. Um, so number two diesel, 52 degrees centigrade. Uh, number one diesel, uh, is, which is kerosene, has a flash point minimum of 38. So it's 38 degrees centigrade. So it's lower. Now, because these flash points are requirements are listed in minimum temperatures, that means that you can pretty easily tell if contamination has occurred by something getting in there that has a lower flash point, like for example, gasoline. Uh, you have no doubt come across many instances where people have talked about the fact they had some diesel fuel and they accidentally got some gasoline in there and they're asking what to do about that. So in such a situation, if you had uh, some number two diesel, a tank full of number two diesel, and somehow some gasoline got in there. It would not take very much contamination at all to throw the flashpoint off by quite a wide margin. 
So 52 degrees is, is actually about 126 degrees Fahrenheit. If you had just 1% contamination with gasoline, so let's say you had 99 gallon or 100 gallons and somebody put in, again, accidentally, we're always going to say accidentally, somebody accidentally got a gallon of gas in there. That's all you had was 1% gasoline contamination. What do you think would happen to the flashpoint, the overall new flashpoint of that diesel fuel? It would actually go down from 52 or, well, 52 is the minimum. So let's say it was at 56. It would go down from 56. It would be lowered by 18 degrees centigrade, which means it's going to go down from 56 to 38 degrees centigrade. And that is out of spec. That's way out of spec. Or another example, somebody had diesel fuel that had a flash, they did a flashpoint test and the flashpoint came back 167 degrees of, of, of Fahrenheit. And um, so they had diesel fuel that had a, a flash, they, it was uncontaminated. Um, I don't know if I said it was contaminated before. This was uncontaminated diesel fuel. Had a flashpoint of 167 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to say that's about, um, well... The math geniuses will correct me, but we'll call that 58 degrees centigrade. It's in spec because remember, the flash point in D975 is a minimum value. So it's in spec. It's good. And somebody added 5% gasoline to that. Again, not that much. And what do you think it did to the flash point? It lowered the flash point from 167 Fahrenheit to 77. It reduced it by 90 degrees, took it down more than half. And of course, if you're then trying to use that diesel fuel and a diesel engine, you are going to have problems. So why does any of this matter? Why does all this flashpoint talk matter? Um, why is it important for, or I should say, what's the benefit for the fuel to have a proper flashpoint temperature. Well, from a practical standpoint, it's important for diesel fuel to, to have a flashpoint that's at least above that minimum threshold. Because if the flashpoint temperature is too low, you know, if that person got that 5% gasoline in there and it, it's, it's now 77 instead of 167, if it's too low, then uh, it can, first of all, it can make the diesel unsafe to handle because you're, the more that you lower flash point, the greater the chance that you're going to have unwanted ignition when you normally wouldn't have to worry about that. Um, from an engine standpoint, there are some people out there who say that you can use a lower flash point diesel fuel um, in an engine and not have operational problems. Um, but when those people say that, they were we we would argue that they're probably thinking of uh, a diesel fuel flash point that isn't you know seventy seven degrees. It is somewhat lower. It's a little bit lower. Let's say instead of one hundred and twenty six, it's one hundred and twenty. And we'd say, okay, you probably could, but if the flash point is substantially lower, like in that five percent example we were giving, then what it's going to do in, in the diesel engine, it's going to prematurely ignite. It's going to ignite too early because the flash point's lower. And if, it, if, if that premature ignition is serious enough, then you're going to get engine damage. So flash point is important because it's essential to the diesel fuel burning properly in that engine. And flash point, the flash point test or verifying the flash point temperature can give you uh, a confirmation if something has contaminated your diesel fuel. So flash point, we slot in at the number seven in our top 10 most important fuel testing methods that you need to know about. All right, going on to number six. This one's an interesting one. Um, and this one also is a little bit similar to Flashpoint. We go number six, ASTM D86, distillation. Okay, most people in this context 
don't really know what distillation is. Well, we're going to explain it to you. We're going to explain why it's important enough to include in this list. So the distillation test, if you will, it's a standard test that's used to give you or to generate a snapshot of the combustion properties of the fuel. And it does it by constructing what they call a distillation curve. So how do you do uh, uh, a distillation test? Well, you have a distillation apparatus, uh, you know, not a moonshine still. We're talking about probably a, a, <clears throat> a glass apparatus in the lab. And you have a sample of fuel con contained uh, and you've got, you're applying heat to it and you're going to heat this fuel up. And, it, you know, it doesn't have to be fuel. It could be some other volatile hydrocarbon, whatever. But in this case, we're talking about fuel. So you heat the fuel up. It's going to boil and it's going to vaporize. It's going to turn from liquid to gas. When it vaporizes, that gas is uh, going to go up into the column because gas is going to rise, right? So already you've got a couple of temperatures. You've got the temperature at which it boils, and that is noted as the, the IBP, the initial boiling point. So that temperature is noted. Um, and then when it vaporizes, it goes up into the distillation column. What's going to happen is that it goes up and it's going to immediately start cooling down. And what do you think happens when that gas cools down? When it cools down, it's going to start condensing, turning back into a liquid. And the way that the, this distillation column or distillation apparatus is constructed, as it cools down and turns back into the liquid, it gets captured. Um, and so what's going to happen is you're going to, the, the gas is going to, going to cool down, cool down, cool down at different temperatures and a greater and greater percentage of the original liquid volume is going to get collected. And the, the, the distillation test is going to keep track of basically what temperature at which temperatures is a certain percentage of the liquid collected again. So the distillation test will note certain temperatures. We already said it notes initial boiling point. It will note uh, tip usually the what they call the T50, the temperature at which 50% of the original liquid is collected again. And the most important uh, uh, part of the distillation test is the T90, the temperature at which 90% of the liquid is recaptured. Now, ASTM D975 has distillation as part of its essential properties, properties that define diesel fuel, but it only requires a T90 temperature and it gives you a temperature range. So for number two diesel, it says that number two diesel fuel oil should have a T90 temperature that falls somewhere between 282 centigrade and 338 degrees centigrade. That's not a narrow gap. That is a, you know, that's a gap of what, 56 degrees centigrade. Um, but that's part of the legal definition. Now, one thing that the refinery can do is the, refi the refinery is the place that makes the diesel fuel. And they, they uh, uh, refine it from the crude oil and they can do certain things in formulating the diesel to tweak the, or to, to kind of move the T90 distillation temperature up or down. They get a little bit higher or a little bit lower while still staying within that 282 to 338 centigrade range. Now, why would they do that? Well, uh, tweaking things. And when we say tweak, basically they mix in certain uh, petroleum hydrocarbons that will then cause it to uh, distill or, or collect at slightly higher, slightly lower temperatures. And the reason they do that is they can affect how the diesel fuel combusts, which then affects the emissions that are produced when that diesel fuel is burned. So for example, to give you an example, if they tweak the composition so that the T90 for a particular number two diesel is 
uh, let's say it's closer to 290 centigrade versus another one that's closer to 320 centigrade. Let's say that they do that. What what effect is, is that going to happen? Well, it's going to produce a diesel fuel. That diesel fuel, when it's burned in an engine, it's actually going to produce lower amounts of nitrous oxide emissions, NOx emissions. And nitrous oxide emissions are really bad for the environment. But there's a trade-off. There's very few things that don't have trade-offs in this world. You can reduce what they call NOx, NOx emissions that way, but it will increase at the same time when that fuel, same fuel's burned, it's going to increase hydrocarbon emissions of certain kinds and carbon monoxide emissions of certain kinds. So it's not a clean trade-off, but that's just one concrete example of what happens when you tweak the T90 distillation temperature up or down a little bit. So the distillation curve, and when we say distillation curve, we, we didn't really explain this before. The distillation curve is what's generated when they're keeping track of what percent of, of the original volume is collected, and then what temperature does that happen at. And of course, they're going to need more than just a T, initial boiling point in a T50 and T90. Typically, they'll take a whole bunch of... Um, uh, measurements, uh, a whole bunch of percentage measurements. And if they get enough of them, they can construct a curve that is actually fairly unique to that particular kind of hydrocarbon blend, um, which is useful or can be useful for identifying uh, what a mystery hydrocarbon is. If it has a distillation curve that looks pretty close to the distillation curve for this other one over here, which is, I don't know, acetone, then, you know, that that tells you something meaningful. So distillation curve and the associated distillation temperatures, they really give you a, a more advanced picture of the thing that a something like a flashpoint temperature really only, only hints at. If diesel fuels in spec, it's going to return... T90 temperatures that are consistently within the range specified in D975. But just like Flashpoint, if the fuel is contaminated with something, like let's say it's contaminated with gasoline, then if it, if it is contaminated with gasoline, then not only is your Flashpoint going to be off significantly, but if you were to run a distillation curve, then your distillation curve results would be off as well. And so for the diagnostic value that the distillation uh, has, that's number six on our list of the 10 most important fuel tests for maintaining and protecting stored fuel health. So that's number six. Number five, we actually have two tests here <clears throat> um, and they're related, they're similar and they're related. So we slot them in at five and four and they are the titration by Carl Fisher at number five, and then water and sediment content at number four. The Carl Fisher and the water sediment tests are almost considered to be different sides of the same coin, which is another reason why we put them in at number five and at number four. Now, these are important because both of them measure key contaminants that are associated with causing problems in stored fuel. The Carl Fisher test measures total water content. The water and sediment test gauges the total amount of water and also the amount of sediment that's in the fuel and delivers you a result that's both of those things together, which is why it's called water and sediment. Now, we put water and sediment one spot above Carl Fisher because water and sediment is the one that is listed, specified in D975. It's the one that is part of the definition for in-spec diesel fuel. Uh, in fact, if I remember correctly, D975 says that you are allowed to have a maximum of 500 parts per million of water and sediment together. If you're above that, 
then you're going to have to do something to remediate that. So let's talk about what each one of these is. So the Carl Fisher test, or as I referenced before, titration by Carl Fisher, that test is the gold standard for measuring water content in fuel. It measures every kind of water that's in the fuel. Free water, emulsified, suspended, you know, water that makes the fuel cloudy. It also measures dissolved, the dissolved water that you can't see. Um, if you remember, all hydrocarbons, gasoline, diesel fuel, whatever, they all have at least a little bit of water content in there. And if you can't, if they look clear and bright, then there's still water in there, but it's a relatively small amount and it's probably dissolved water. Well, the Carl Fisher test will catch that. So why is it good to know water content? Well, knowing water content is important because water content's related to microbial growth. And if you have too much water content, not only is it easier for microbes to grow, but excess water content in the fuel can also um, force warranty issues with engine manufacturers. Um, so the Carl Fisher test is important for knowing those things. The water and sediment test, like we said, we put it one spot ahead because water and sediment is part of D975. Now, what does it do? It measures the total amount of both water and sediment that's in a particular sample. How do they run it? They take a fuel sample, and they put it in a, 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 a test tube, right? And they put it in a centrifuge, and they centrifuge it, they spin it. And as they spin it, it's all, any water and any sediment that's hanging around in that fuel sample is essentially going to break away and it's going to sink to the bottom of that test tube. The, uh, you know, they stop the centrifuging and they're able to measure it, and they measure it by weight. Um, D975 says you can have a maximum of 500 parts per million of water and sediment. Um, in percentage terms, a 1% is, I believe, 10,000 parts per million. So you're talking about uh, five one hundredths of a percent. That's the maximum that you're allowed. Most healthy fuels aren't going to approach 500 ppm. They're going to be, you know, under 100 or maybe between 100 and 100 and 200 ppm. So if your stored fuel fails either of these two tests, that is a clear sign that you have to take some action because if you don't have problems up to that point, but you have fail, you have too much water or you have too much water and sediment together, that is, if it's not diagnostic, it's definitely predictive that problems are coming down the road unless you do something uh, of, about it. And the most serious issue, if you fail a water and sediment test, your fuel's out of spec and you're legally required to do something about it, especially if you want to give it to somebody else to you. So, we're slotting in at number five and number four, the titration by Carl Fisher test and the water and sediment test. Okay, moving on to number three. Number three in our most important fuel test that you need to know is cetane number. So, cetane affectionately known as diesel's analog to octane or the diesel equivalent of octane. Uh, cetane number is important as an expression of the combustion quality of a diesel fuel in the sense that, uh, in the sense of giving you an idea of whether that diesel fuel is going to ignite at the proper time in the diesel fuel engine cycle, so to speak. It is the diesel equivalent of octane and gasoline, but it actually expresses an opposite characteristic to octane in gasoline. See, if you have a gasoline engine, a spark ignition engine, um, if the gasoline that you have in there uh, uh, is deficient in octane value, what's going to happen? Th those of us who are older, I mean, I'm not going to include myself because I'm really not that old, but those in our audience who are older will remember the days when you would get the knocking and the pinging and the pre, what they call pre-ignition. That is because if the octane value of the gasoline is not high enough, 
it will ignite too quickly relative to the position of the piston in the the the, the cycle. And if it ignites too fifth too too quickly, it causes problems. The engine doesn't work as well. It knocks. It makes noise. And if it's serious enough, it can cause engine damage. Now, we said that cetane expresses an opposite characteristic. Insufficient cetane value of diesel fuel is going to result in the fuel igniting not too quickly, not prematurely, but actually too late. The fuel is going to ignite too slowly in the cycle. And again, because it's not igniting at exactly the right time, the engine doesn't deliver the amount of power, doesn't do the amount of work that it was designed to do because the fuel is not igniting at the right time relative to everything else. So, um, in that sense, um, cetane value, or let's say if you were to use a chemical to fix this, which this is one of those things that you can, you, you would use a chemical, a cetane improver to fix. That cetane improver would actually act as a, shall we say, a combustion, uh, well, combustion enhancer, yes, a combustion speeder, if you will. It would make the combustion actually happen faster. Okay. Now, a couple of things to say about cetane value. First thing is, when we use these terms cetane, or if we're talking about gasoline, we use the term octane. Those are, uh, both of those are, the way that we colloquially refer to the combustion quality of the fuel. Diesel, you know, you have diesel fuel that's not igniting properly. Someone would say, oh, the, the cetane's too low. Or in gasoline, oh, your your octane's too low for your engine. Okay, there are colloquial references to, to talking about the combustion quality of the gasoline or the diesel fuel. When we say cetane or octane, we don't actually mean the pure molecules octane or cetane, which are actually standalone hydrocarbons in themselves. Octane is oct is eight. It's an eight chain hydrocarbon, eight chain, eight carbon straight chain hydrocarbon. Cetane is also called hexadecane and it's got like C16H34. Both of those are actual hydrocarbons. But when we say cetane and octane, or when we say adding cetane or adding octane, we don't actually mean we're adding more of those things. Okay, that's number one. Now, the reason. When we talk about cetane, the reason why it's called cetane rating is because the, the primary test, remember we're talking about tests here. So the test that we use to express the cetane rating of the fuel uh, uses an index. And that index compares the results the, uh, that you get from the fuel in question and it puts it on a scale of from 15 to 100. Now, 100 is the highest value, also happens to be the value that pure cetane uh, will, will deliver if you ran it through this as the fuel in this test. And when we say this test, um, it, 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 it's basically, it's a test run in, in a specific kind of test engine where they're able to measure when combustion happens relative to the piston stroke cycle. That's the easiest way to, to, to describe how this test is done. So the highest value that something can have on a cetane rating test or a cetane number test is 100 because that's the value that pure cetane will have. The lowest value you can have is 15, and that is the value that this other molecule, isocetane, has. It has the lowest cetane value. And so your diesel fuel is gonna fall somewhere in the middle. And so it's gonna take uh, the results of this test, and it's gonna look where it falls, and then it's gonna say it fell, you know, here, you know, for those listening to on the radio, I'm holding my hand up in a vertical line. So it falls here. That relates to 44. So that fuel has a cetane value or cetane number of 44. Um, so that's how they run the test. The minimum cetane that you can have, as stated in D975, because cetane is part of the D975 spec, 
says that the minimum cetane value for, for legal diesel fuel in the United States is 40. But that's actually lower than some other places in the world. Places like Japan and the European Union actually require 50. Higher cetane value, generally speaking, better combustion. Um, you know, all of the things being equal, of course. So the D975 spec, this is another thing that you need to know. The, when you look in the D975 specification, it does list cetane number and whatever ASTM number is associated with that test. However, one of the one of the unique nuances to this is that there's another test that D975 actually allows you to use as a substitute for cetane number. And they call that cetane index. Now, what's the difference? Well, we already told you the cetane number test requires a specific specialized engine that not everybody has. And you're running fuels through your, your there's there's special equipment that's that's detecting when combustion happens. And bottom line is that it's not an inexpensive test. It will usually cost, well, before inflation hit, it would cost you maybe about $500 for someone to do that test. The cetane index test actually generates results that are legally equivalent to cetane number, but it costs a whole lot less. Now, why does it cost less? Well, first of all, it costs less because you don't have to use a cetane engine to do the test. But cetane index is actually a combination of two simpler tests where they take the results of those two tests and they put them into this formula. And the formula will calculate what an estimate of what the cetane number would actually be. And it is close enough that legally you can substitute cetane index for cetane number. And I said cetane index was cheaper. It's because the two tests that it uses are much, much simpler. It is a combination of density and that distillation test that we talked about. Well, distillation and density you can have run for a whole lot less than 500 bucks. Um, and you'll get, you'll get results that uh, are considered to be legally equivalent. Now, there is one caveat when you're considering uh, you know, using a, substituting a cetane index test. The one caveat that you have to remember when you, if you're considering substituting cetane index is the cetane index measurement, if you will, calculation, maybe a better way to put it, Cetane index will not show any improvement if you add a chemical cetane improver to the fuel. So what you wouldn't do is, for example, you have stored fuel. You need to know if the cetane value is still enough to run your engine. So you have a cetane index test and it tells you that your cetane index is 41. Well, that's above legal, the legal floor but you'd like it to be a little bit higher because you know your engines run better. So you say, I'm going to add a cetane, some cetane improver chemical, which would be the right thing to do. And I'm going to raise it up to 45. So you add some and then you say, okay, we're going to run a follow-up test. Um, what you wouldn't do is run another cetane index test. That's because what, what has happened, the reason you wouldn't do this is, remember, cetane index takes density and distillation. And adding a little bit of, of, of cetane uh, uh, improver chemical won't appreciably change the density, and it actually will not have any effect on the T90 distillation. And so, because of those two things, the cetane index is actually going to appear basically unchanged, when in reality, if you were to run a proper cetane number test on that additized fuel, it would show that adding that, that cetane improver raised your cetane number, your fuel cetane number from 41 to 45 or 46. So that's the one caveat that you have to keep in mind 
when you're talking about using a CTAIN index test. So the CTAIN number slash CTAIN index tests show up at number three on our list because they are tests that measure the attribute of diesel fuel that if it's out of spec will cause noticeable performance problems and will also cause it legally to be out of spec and fail D975. But unlike some other things, it's easily correctable. So that's number three. We are down to the top two, what we consider to be the two most important tests that you need to be familiar with if you manage stored fuel, if you take care of stored fuel for your job or for some other important arena. Number two, the runner-up, oxidative stability. So the oxidative stability test is, again, remember last episode and then earlier we have referenced descriptive versus predictive tests. Um, uh, uh, Flashpoint was a descriptive test. Oxidative stability is a predictive test in that you can use the results uh, as a view, as a predictive view of what may happen to the fuel or the what may happen to the fuel's condition rather in the near future. The oxidative stability test is, we'll call it an index reflection of the likelihood that the fuel's condition is going to change at some point in the future. Now, how do they run one of them? Well, oxidative stability um, uh, produces its results by essentially simulating, trying to simulate what would ha happen in the fuel as it is exposed to air over the course of its uh, lifetime. Now, the test is known as accelerated oxidative stability because the test actually involves creating conditions that try and actually compress time or speed things up. How do they do that? Well, they raise the temperature because chemical, you know, stability and instability are all about chemical reactions that happen in the fuel. So they raise the temperature to try and make any, any reactions that are gonna happen, they're gonna happen faster. And then another thing that they do is they force exposure to high amounts of oxygen. Basically, they're trying to, to compress time speed or speed time up, if you will. So the test does those two things to try and accelerate things. And then at the end of the test period, they take the fuel, which now probably has some, you know, bad things that have been formed in it, and they filter it. And the oxidation products uh, are left behind on filter paper. And then they put the filter paper in a machine that shines uh, light on the paper and actually measures the amount of light that's reflected back. And it generates this measurement that's called reflectance. And there's a scale. It says that the reflectance is this much, then that means the stability, the oxidative stability score is going to be this, and so on and so forth. So one thing that the oxidative stability test uh, does not measure is it does not measure the condition of the fuel in the sense of, of, of measuring the sediment that started out in the fuel or isolating what I would call isolatable sediment. Uh, the water and sediment test actually actually does that. And what, what I mean by, by that, because I realize that might be a little confusing. Um, if you needed to know right now if your fuel had sediment in it, if sediment had already been formed in it, you wouldn't use an oxidative stability test to try and do that. You would use a water and sediment test. The water and sediment test the only thing it does is it isolates water and sediment and then allows you to measure them. What oxidative stability tries to do is it tries to speed time up and tell you in the near future, there's a good chance that you're going to get uh, you know, oxidation products, sludge, sediment, varnishes, gums formed in your fuel. It gives you a predictive picture of the likelihood of that to happen in the near future. 
So in that sense, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a predictive test. The, the results of the oxidative stability test express how likely the fuel is to change condition at some point in the future. Now, we keep saying at some point in the future. How far in the future? Ah, that's where we start getting into the it depends. You know, how far in the future? That is always an it depends answer because it depends on what the storage conditions are going to be for the fuel in the future. And there's not always, you know, that's not always the same, which is why, uh, you know, it's different from a water and sediment test in that water and sediment will say, based on the storage conditions that this fuel has actually been in up to this point, there is this amount of sediment in the fuel. Good. That's useful information. But someone couldn't say, we'll run an oxidative stability test and we're going to get this amount of sediment based on these storage conditions because you don't, because there's too many factors that influence how sediment and oxidative products are, are formed. So in that sense, it's always kind of an, it depends nebulous answer, um, but it's an important answer to have nonetheless. The, re, the, 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 uh, the fact that it's not the kind of descriptive measurement test that, I, that a water and sediment test is, is probably the biggest reason why oxidative stability is not actually listed in ASTM D975 for the same reason that cold filter plug point is also not listed in D975. Um, but both of those are really, really important to know if you're managing stored fuel and if you want to get a picture of, of whether you need to do something in the, to head off problems. Now, at this point, someone may ask whether the test results for an oxidative stability test mean anything specific in terms of time. That's really another way of saying, how long does my fuel have before I have a problem? That is a question people will ask in one way or another. And the answer to that is what we were just talking about. Um, it depends. Oxidative stability cannot give you an answer relative to time. All it can do is give you a, a pretty good, reliable picture of whether it's more or less likely for uh, oxidative uh, you know, stability problems to happen in the near future. Maybe that's a good way of putting it. So if you have fuel that has a, a poor oxidative stability result, uh, one other thing to keep in mind is having a poor result on this kind of stability test is not the same thing as saying the fuel is unstable right now. This is an important point. Um, and we know this, or we can better understand this rather, if, if we, we take that phrase, you know, the, 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 the term unstable, if we substitute the term changing. Okay, so let's reword it. Having a poor oxidative stability test result is not the same as saying the fuel is changing right now because we would ask changing into what we really mean when we say that it's not the same as saying the fuel is forming undesirable things like gums and varnishes right now you know if you have an oxidative stability test and varnishes and stuff you know reflectance products remember how it was run those are formed and those are caught on the on on the filter paper if you have this test and those things are formed um, what you could say is when time was speeded up or compressed, the fuel ended up with unstable molecules formed at that time. But that's always an in the future kind of thing. The oxidative stability test is not intended to isolate and measure things that are in the fuel right now. It is designed to give us a view of of whether those are likely to be formed in the fuel in the near future under uh, normal storage conditions. Okay, so last, maybe the last point on the number two test here. 
if you had a fuel, uh, a diesel fuel sample, and it had a, a poor oxidative stability rating, but you ran a water and sediment test on it as well, and it was clean of sediment. So you got clean fuel, looks good. It's, it's well within spec when it comes to water and sediment. But when you run a uh, uh, oxidative stability test on it, it forms oxidative products. What can you conclude about that? Now, this is a situation that that is not a really rare one. It happens more often than you think because we get this kind of question. We got this kind of question more than once. Um, what we would say about that fuel is the fuel's condition right now is good. It is in spec. It is healthy. It's not going to cause you problems. It is uh, going to work the way you need it to. But what we would say is the oxidative stability test has told us something important about it. It has told us that if you leave that fuel, it is, it's, it's probably got some precursors already in it that, that don't get isolated as sediments. They're too small, maybe. But they're in the fuel, and they are going to start reacting in the near future, and they're going to form things in that fuel that you don't want to be in there. And so you need to keep an eye on it for the future. You need to monitor its condition. You definitely need to add a fuel stabilizer. Adding a fuel stabilizer um, is probably the most important thing to preserving an oxidative stability uh, result. If you have sediment already in there, then what you would do, you wouldn't use a stabilizer for that. You would use a mechanical process, a, a filtering or a fuel polishing process to get those out. And then once you got those out, you would want to add stabilizer to keep the fuel from further degrading. Okay, so that's the second most important test, the oxidative stability test for stored fuel. And that brings us to the last one on our list, what we think is the most important fuel test that you need to be aware of, that you need to consider using um, to maintain the health of your stored fuel, and that is ATP microbial testing. We come to the number one most important test for your fuel, that is the ATP microbial test. Um, why is this kind of micro test? Why is it number one? You know, that maybe that's the first test to start off. Why is this number one? Why is it higher than oxidative stability? Why is it higher than flashpoint? You know, cold filter plug point, those ones. Why are micro tests important? A uh, number of reasons. Let's list off three of them. Okay. First reason, microbes are the biggest problem in stored fuel today. The way the fuel has changed, you, it's a lot more common to get microbes in that fuel. And when microbes establish themselves in fuel systems, storage tanks, they do all sorts of bad things. They degrade the fuel. They destroy the fuel's quality. They plug filters. They create biomass and biofilms that stick to surfaces. They cause corrosion, severe and pretty expensive corrosion damage in tanks and fuel systems. Um, they're, you know, they're bad news. So that's reason number one. Reason number two is that microbial contamination problems are difficult to get rid of. Um, just think about the way disease spreads. One infected person gives it to another infected person. If you have a tank as part of a fuel system and it develops a micro problem, when that fuel goes through the system and goes to other parts, it is going to bring that microbial problem with it and spread it to all of those different areas. So microbe problems are easily spread and they're difficult to get rid of because the only way that you can get rid of a micro problem is to use a biocide, to use a chemical treatment called a biocide. Um, it's the only way to get rid of a micro problem. Number three, microbial growth is strongly linked to the presence of water in fuel tanks and fuel systems. And we know that you give them enough time, virtually any system, any storage tank that you come across 
is going to have water in them, and it's going to have the possibility of microbial contamination. And one of the problems with having microbes, one of the problems with microbial contamination is that if you don't have a way to test for them specifically, then how will you know if you've got a problem? The only way you would know is if you're relying on, if you're trying to recognize what you think are the symptoms of infection to kind of clue you in that something's wrong. But the problem is, as with many things in life, once the symptoms are severe enough to uh, severe enough and developed enough for you to, to, to be able to observe them, the damage is already well on its way to being done. Um, another reason microbial testing is settles in a number one on our list is that the, you know today's ultra low sulfur diesel fuels have a lot less resistance. It's a lot e it happens a lot easier in today's fuels than it used to. We have mentioned this before. People used to think that um, uh, you know all you had to do was control water. We know that's not true. When people started trying to figure out why these fuels you know, have such an easier time getting microbial contamination, the first thing they pointed to was because the sulfur's lower and sulfur must have you know, some kind of you know, whatever natural biocide effect. And that's not exactly. Uh, I mean, microbes don't exactly, at least some microbes, don't exactly love being around a lot of sulfur, but there are plenty of microbes that are just fine hanging around sulfur. Um, the thing that was just as contributory to the problem, if you will, was that they also played with the legal cap on aromatic content. And that created, because aromatic content, um, it's a type of carbon molecule. When, you, when it burns as part of the fuel, and you get the emissions coming out, it actually contributes to making some you know, pretty bad things for air quality, like ground level ozone, stuff like that. So they limited the amount of aromatics that the refinery could blend in. And uh, unfortunately for the fuel, microbes don't like aromatics. They like what you replace them with. And so you basically have a new fuel blend that has more of the stuff that microbes love to be in. And so you get more microbial problems. And then also, last but not least, ultra-low sulfur diesel fuel in itself attracts water. It's hygroscopic. It attracts more water. It especially attracts more water if you mix a little bit of biodiesel into it like every bit of ultra-low sulfur diesel across the country has. So it attracts more water, which is better for microbes too. So... You know, those three reasons, it's a big problem, it's easy, difficult to get rid of, it's easy to spread, causes a lot of damage, and it's a lot more common today than it used to be. And so people who manage fuel, you know, whether that's you, with somebody else in your organization, the people who manage the fuel have to get a handle on this problem. And the only way to get a hand, properly get a handle on microbial issues, if you're managing fuel, is you have to test for them. You must test. There is no other way to, to get around the problem. So the question then is, how often do you need the test? Okay, that's a valid question. Um, and how should you test? That's also a valid question. So let's talk about a couple of those. How often should you test? Well, when we say you need to test, it's not like we're saying, well, you got to test every week. No, you don't need to do that. But, uh, you know, we tested, you know, 10 years ago. Well, that that's irrelevant too. Ideally, um, you know, every six months is fine. Some people test every three months, depending on how, how mission critical their systems are. Um, you probably don't need to test every month. Every three months is probably the limit on up to the ideal. Every six months is probably going to be much better than what you're already doing. Okay, so that's how often should you test. But how should you test? And this is where we have to start considering the different kinds of tests that you can run because there are multiple kinds of tests, uh, multiple testing technologies, <clears throat> if you will. Um, there's these culture tests. There's 
the fuel stat, lateral flow transfer devices. There's the 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 Merck uh, ATP pens, and those had their pros and cons. But um, you know, having been in this industry for a while and have looked at having looked at the pros and cons of all these, we would say that <coughs> excuse me, the best tests to use are the ATP by filtration tests. Um, they uh, they have a number of advantages. They they can be done in the field where you're at. Okay, so you don't have to send results to some lab. If you have the right equipment, you can do them where you're at. Uh, the results can be done quickly, so you can do a test, unlike a culture test that takes four or five, maybe seven days to get results back. You get results back in like five to ten minutes which means you then you have immediate results that you can then make decisions on right then. Um, and the results that you get from a, a ATP by filtration test are quantifiable. So you're not getting a low, medium, high result like you do with fuel stat LFTs. You're not relying on counting individual spots like on a micro monitor culture test. You're getting a number back. And if you know for your specific system, what number is good or bad, what number you need to stay below, if you're above that number, now you know you have to take action. It makes making those decisions pretty easy, and um, it speaks to a couple of really important things. Um, it speaks to the fact that everybody's tank is different, so different tanks have different conditions associated with them, and grow microbes at different rates. So each tank has its own fingerprint, if you will. And so if you know your tank's fingerprint, if you run ATP tests enough that you get a body of data that tells you that, uh, you know, microbes take a long time to grow in your system, then that's going to keep you from taking action when you don't need to. It allows you the kind of data that you get back from an ATP by filtration test will enable you to make condition, make uh, decisions that are specific to your situation. And it keeps you from having to rely on general conclusions formed from everybody else's data who aren't in your situation. And there's, there's value to that. Um, ATB by, by filtration does require equipment to do testing. Um, so startup costs can be higher than doing a culture test. But if you're a hospital, um, if you are a municipality, if you're an aviation company, aviation uh, 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 companies do a lot of this kind of testing. Um, another area that does a lot of this kind of testing is the upstream oil and gas. You know, They have millions upon millions of dollars of equipment that gets damaged by microbial contamination. And they spend a lot of money on ATP by filtration tests. That should tell you that that kind of testing um, is a pretty valuable thing. So in terms of how you get the equipment for this, um, you can get them from places like the, the fuel pulse line from Bell Performance is one place that you can get the equipment. And also you can get test kits that uh, uh, give you everything that you need to run a test, or if you don't, if you don't want to uh, run the test yourself, then Fuel Pulse actually has sample submission kits, which has everything that you need to pull a sample, package it up, put ice packs in it so the condition doesn't change, and then it actually gets sent back to the Fuel Pulse lab, and they will run the test and give you a report on your, uh, your, your, your results, and then also recommendations based on what those results are. So that is it. The 10 most important fuel tests for managing and protecting the condition of stored fuel, all the way from um, density at number 10 up to ATP by filtration microbial testing at number one. So that about wraps things up for today's episode of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. Uh, thank you again for spending part of your day or evening with us. Check the show notes at our website, www.bellperformance.com, for links and information to everything that was mentioned in this episode. Um, 
please be sure to subscribe to this podcast in iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you happen to get your podcast. Last but not least, if you liked what you heard, please leave us a review of the podcast at your preferred site because that is, we say it every time because it's true, it's one of the most important ways that will help people find us. So thanks for joining us again. I am Eric Bjornstad. See you next time at the Fuel Pulse Show podcast.